All right. Let's begin the. All right, let's begin the discussion. So the first question, question about race relations. Uh, I talked to, which group is that? I can't remember which group. I talked to you guys uh, about race relations in the movie. Um, this question is probably today's hardest question. Uh, first of all, because the Chinese subtitles were not very good. I'm sorry about that but also because I think most of you are not very familiar with American race relations. Uh, so you might not have understood the context or the background of what's going on in terms of race. So uh, let's talk about this in more detail. We can think about three moments uh, in the film where a black person and a white person are interacting. So uh, the First one, I think we can uh, talk about Lewis. Lewis is the character played by Robert De Niro. Uh, he's the guy who's sitting in Ordell's apartment, not doing anything until the end of the movie when he joins the plan and then later he gets annoyed by Melanie and so shoots her. So the idea is that Lewis, he's a white guy, he's older than Ordell but he's a follower. He's not really the person with the most power in the situation. Uh, and part of it is because the movie mentions very early on that he just got out of jail for robbing a bank. Uh, and, you know, robbing a bank in America that will get you at least 20 years. So he gets out of jail in the 90s, which means that he went into jail in the 70s. Think about how much difference that makes between 1970 and 1990. Think about how much has changed. When he gets out, he really doesn't understand the society anymore. Uh, if you remember, um, Ordell brings him to visit Max. And then he's like in the front office. Uh, Lewis is in the front office looking at stuff. And Ordell says, why don't you go wait in the car? Take this key. Uh, and then Lewis takes the key and he says, how do I use this? And Ordell says, you just point it at the car and you press the button and it will unlock. So he doesn't even know how to use a car remote because it was invented while he was in jail. So Lewis, he doesn't really fit into this society. Well, when he's interacting with people, he doesn't really know how he's supposed to interact with them. Uh, Early in the movie, he goes to visit Shonda, the black woman who dances for him. And, you know, it's an entertaining, sexy dance, but he's just sitting in the chair, rocking back and forth. He doesn't really know how to react. He doesn't know what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. Um, and then, of course, finally, uh, when he joins the plan, he doesn't know how to handle Melanie. Uh, of course, Melanie is not black, right? She's white. But the idea here is that even among other white people, he doesn't know how to handle them, how to behave with them. And so when Melanie gets too annoying, he just shoots her. So that's one example. Another moment we can think of is when Max and Ordell first meet. So the very beginning of the movie, Beaumont Livingston gets caught and he needs 10,000 US dollars to uh, be bailed out from jail. So the idea is the judge says you can, uh, if you uh, give the court ten thousand uh, dollars, we will give it back to you when you come back for your trial and and uh, if you're guilty when you go to jail. It's collateral. Yeah. Now, um, Max is in the business of providing this kind of money. He takes on the risk. Uh, of somebody running away and he might lose the money. And he does this for a fee. I think it was, what, 5%? So Ordell goes to see Max and he says, my friend Beaumont uh, needs $10,000 in bond. Uh, and Max says, uh, okay, uh, where, when does he need it? And Ordell says, I have the money right here. 
in this suitcase. And Max says, well, if you have the money, why are you here? Why don't you you'd pay the, the bond? And Ordell says something very interesting. He says, can you imagine what would happen to me, a black man who walks into the court with a suitcase full of $10,000 in cash? They would never let me leave. So Ordell is saying that like the system, which is run by white people, doesn't really trust black people who do unexpected things. If he walks into that court with $10,000, the court and the, the police will think that he stole the money or something, or did something illegal to get the money. Now, of course, in this case, he did do something illegal to, to earn the money, but that's not the point. The point is that the police and everybody would suspect him. And then Max also gives a very interesting response. He says, so you're trying to white guilt trip me? Are you trying to use white guilt to manipulate me? The idea here is that because white people have done so much bad stuff to black people throughout American history, sometimes a black person will say, you should do this, this, this for me because you are white. And Max is saying, are you trying to do that with me? Uh, they get over this argument, but the interesting thing is that they both use race relations in their negotiation. It's not something that they avoid. It's not something that, that makes them embarrassed. It's something that they use for their own benefit. Uh, and then the third example we can think about is the relationship between Jackie and Max. Jackie is, of course, a black woman. Uh, Max being the white guy. Uh, and their relationship in this movie is probably like the most romantic, the purest, the nicest thing in the whole movie. Uh, and it's also surprising in terms of race relations, because usually we expect the white person to be in charge. But here, Jackie is the one who has the plan. Jackie is the one who uh, attracts Max's attention. When the first time they meet, is Max picking her up from jail, and he sees her walking down this long courtyard, and she's walking in slow motion, and he thinks, oh my God, she's so beautiful. Uh, and then later, Jackie steals his gun. So he's, he, when he goes back to ask for his gun again, Jackie is wearing a bathrobe, and she puts on some sexy Deftones music. It feels like a seduction. It turns out it's not a seduction, or at least it's not a sexual seduction. It's more like a criminal seduction. Um, but from the very beginning, Jackie is in charge, uh, is taking the lead in their relationship. Uh, and we, you know, Max lets her take the lead. He doesn't try to fight to be in the lead in their relationship. He lets her make all of the decisions. And by doing that, he earns some extra money. <laughs> So here we have an example of race relations where both sides kind of know that this is not the usual situation, but both sides don't care and they uh, keep going anyway, and it turns out good for them. So the, I think from these three examples, we can say that the film is less about saying like, are black people right, are white people right? It's more about saying how important it is to be aware of race relations um, and what you do with them or whether you can safely ignore them or not. Question two was about gender relations, men and women. I talked to that group over there and they mentioned that the film is quite unusual because it's Jackie Brown, a woman who outsmarts everybody. Uh, she's caught in between two groups of men. On one side, Ordell. On the other side, the cops. Uh, and in most of the movie, it feels like it's the men who are leading the events, right? Ordell is trying to figure out whether he can trust Jackie. He has a plan to get his money out of Mexico. The cops also want Jackie to work for them. They hatch a plan, and Jackie agrees to help them. 
But the only really important plan is the one that Jackie leads, that nobody else knows about except for Max. Uh, so again, the only unusual relationship here is between Jackie and Max, because Max lets Jackie, again, take the lead, even though he's a man and she's a woman. Uh, whereas the two groups led by men all get cheated by Jackie. Um, this group also mentioned that the few other women in the film uh, don't do as well as Jackie. Melanie is smart enough to understand Ordell's plan, but she gets killed because she isn't smart enough to realize her position in the plan as a woman under the control of men. Shonda, the black woman who dances for Lewis and is supposed to be the woman who takes the money from Jackie, runs away. She she's, is also lucky to get away from this situation. And then finally, we have the really nervous uh, girl who works for Ordell. Uh, she try, she In the rehearsal, she's the one who takes the money from Jackie. And she really feels like a broken woman. Like she's so nervous that she can barely talk. She can, uh, she only eats when Jackie lets her eat. She says, go ahead and eat. And so she eats. Uh, and perhaps we can see her as a kind of example of if a woman in this kind of situation does not try to preserve her independence and autonomy, uh, if she is entirely controlled by the men, it's not good for her because the men in this situation only care about themselves. They use the women around them and they don't really care about the women. The women have to fight for themselves. Question three, this idea of rationalizing. So I was talking with this group over here and they think that uh, what Jackie says makes sense. When you start doing something, uh, sometimes in order to finish, you have to give, you have to tell yourself reasons, even if the reasons don't really make sense or if they're not good reasons. But specifically for this situation, the second part of the question, is this a good response for this situation? This group also agrees. This is probably the best answer Jackie could give because she has already decided to steal the money from Ordell. They, they have already finished planning. They're going to, to execute the plan the next day. If they think too hard about, is this a good idea? They might not actually do the plan. Uh, so according to this group, since they already decided to carry out the plan, they shouldn't think too hard about this question. So when Jackie says, uh, that's what we do, we rationalize, she's, that's what she means. If we want to keep doing it, we can't think too hard about the plan and whether it's a good idea or not. But underneath this answer is the assumption that if you do think too carefully about this plan, you might not do it because maybe it's not really a good idea. You're stealing from a very powerful man who is a criminal and doesn't care about killing people. You're also stealing from the cops who are white and are already prejudiced against black people. If anything goes wrong, uh, Jackie is doomed and Max probably also. Um, but this group also added an interesting idea, which is why didn't Jackie think about these things earlier? Why is she only thinking about them the night before? Maybe it's because the reasons that she gives herself, the rationalizations, point to the fact that it's not a really, really bad thing. It's not like they're killing somebody. They're stealing from a criminal. Is it illegal? Yes. Is it wrong? Maybe. And this maybe gives them enough space to not have to think about this question until they like right before they do it and they're really nervous and they think about a, a lots of things. Uh, so her response, we have to rationalize in order to finish, probably suggests that it's not exactly a good idea uh, to do this. 
Question four, trick angles. I was talking with group one about this. Um, Tarantino is kind of famous for using trick angles. He likes to shoot from uh, angles where people don't really see things. Like in a regular movie, the, the camera angle is supposed to be close to a human perspective. But in the two shots in the question, right, one is from the, the trunk of a car where nobody is currently inside. The other one is from Ordell's body. He's already dead. These are not regular human angles. So we can think of them as trick angles. Why does Tarantino do this? Group one uh, gave a very interesting answer. They said that Tarantino shoots from these two angles because it is the center of gravity of the scene. It is the most important part of the scene. In the first one, Ordell and Beaumont are talking about whether Beaumont should get into the trunk. Their discussion is of revolving around this trunk of the car. It is the most important thing in the scene. So that's where Tarantino puts the camera. The second scene, even though Ordell is now dead, everybody is still looking at his body. They're still talking about him. He's still the most important part of the scene. So that's where Tarantino puts his camera. Now, when you put your camera at the center of gravity, you have a very big benefit. When people talk about something important, they usually look at it, face it. So when everybody is talking about this one thing, everybody is facing it, and you put the camera there, you can immediately capture the face of everybody. There's no question of, can the camera see you? Are you blocking anything? They're naturally looking toward the camera. Um, and as for the first scene, the one about the trunk, it also solves a practical problem. If you think about this situation logically, the two characters are facing the car and the trunk is open. So where else would you put the camera? If you put it on top of the car, the characters will be blocked by the trunk hood. Uh, if you put it anywhere else, you can't really see both characters at the same time. If you pretend like there's no car and you just put the camera right in front of them, it makes no sense. You're ignoring the whole car. So it's also a practical solution. The only place they can put the camera and uh, still preserve the logic of the scene is to put it inside the trunk. And it, also, it's fun, right? It's fun to see a shot from an unexpected angle. And it makes you think, especially the first scene. If you're looking out from inside the trunk, it makes you think, how will Beaumont feel when he gets into the trunk? How will he react? Or is there anything else in the trunk that we don't see because the camera is there? That's another interesting thing, right? If you're looking from a point, you don't know what is on that point. If I'm looking at you now, I don't know what I'm standing on. So wherever you put the camera is actually a blind spot. Because the camera's there, you don't see what else is there. And so in terms of the car trunk, that also creates some mystery. We did get an early shot. Uh, or they'll open the trunk, we look inside, and there are some guns. But by putting the camera there, it kind of suggests that maybe there's something else that we didn't see. Turns out, no, there's nothing else. But there is a surprise, and so the surprise is that Ordell kills Beaumont. Question five, the final shot. I talked to uh, that group over there about this, and they mentioned that uh, when Jackie is kind of singing along to the radio, it feels like she's being set free. She no longer has to worry about Ordell. She no longer has to worry about the cops. She has the money. She's getting away with it. And so she's able to let loose, to celebrate and have a little fun by singing along with the radio. At the same time, she's not singing along in a very joyful, openly happy way. She's singing along in a kind of unconscious way. And so that suggests that maybe it's not a perfect ending. And then we think about how she's 
leaving alone. She's not leaving with Max. We also think about all the people who died along the way. Um, Melanie, Lewis, Ordell himself, and Beaumont, you can also count him. Four people had to die in order for her to get this money. So it's kind of, it's a bittersweet ending that's more toward the sweet and less about the bitter, but it's still mixed. And then also the theme song itself is very interesting. The theme song is called Across 110th Street. 110th Street is the southern boundary of Harlem in New York City. Harlem is the traditional neighborhood for black people. So when you cross 110th Street, uh, let's say you're leaving Harlem, that's when a black person enters a white world. So it's kind of echoing how Jackie is leaving behind her community and going off into the bigger, wider world. And so the idea of leaving behind your home is also kind of bittersweet. You're looking forward to your new adventures, but you're sad to leave behind everything that you were already familiar with. And question six, I don't think I had the chance to discuss this question. Uh, but we can talk about it now. Why is the film so damn long? Well, part of it could be because it's not just about stealing money. It's also about all of these ideas that we were just talking about. Uh, the, the different characters, their relationships, the community, the racial issues, the gender issues. So in order to really give us a sense of this world, it takes time. It takes time for us to understand people. It takes time for us to understand how things work. What are the expectations? And also, Jackie is stealing from two different parties, from Ordell and from the cops. So we also need time to understand that triangle relationship. How are the cops playing Odell? Uh, Ordell? How are, is Ordell playing the cops? And how is Jackie playing both of them at the same time? So could this have been a shorter movie? What parts of it could have been cut? Honestly, I don't think there could have been any major cuts. Like maybe this scene could have been shorter. Maybe that scene could have been shorter. And most it would add up to like uh, saving like 15 minutes. But there doesn't seem to be some entire section that could be cut. And that really points to how careful uh, Tarantino was in adapting this movie from the novel and in shooting the actual film from his script. Or I don't know, maybe you disagree. Are there parts of the movie that you think could have been cut? Well, if you have some thoughts, you can tell me later. OK, so that's the discussion. Any questions? Great. If you didn't have the chance to watch this movie from front to back, from start to finish, uh, it's a pretty good movie. I encourage you to. Uh, Download it from Moodle and uh, take some time to watch it yourself. Okay, the moment you've all been waiting for, the midterm exam. Uh, here are the exam rules. It's a take home online essay question. Um, but it's an open-ended question. There's no standard answer there's no right or wrong answer i will be giving your grade based on the format of your answer and not the content so let's go over the uh, detailed rules first one i will give you one week so there's a deadline but there's no timer so you can start any time and you will still have all the way until the deadline. I'm not going to limit your answer to within two hours, within three hours. You have the whole week. Uh, actually, you have here all of this time. Today, after 
class ends all the way to next Thursday midnight is when you can do the midterm exam. Uh, your answer must be an English essay with multiple non-itemized paragraphs. So there are a few parts to this one. It has to be in English because we are the Department of Applied English. So, you know, we have to apply the English. It has to be an essay. So don't give me individual sentences. Please write an essay with multiple paragraphs, more than one paragraph. And then finally, we have this word. Non-itemized. To itemize means to give point by point. Uh, or Non-itemized just means only give me paragraphs. So don't say one, two, three. Don't give me bullet points. Give me paragraphs. And in those paragraphs, you should not have subtitles. So like uh, if your answer is, uh, the, for example, the first paragraph, you say characters, colon, maha, and then blah, blah, blah. The second paragraph, story, colon, blah, blah, blah. That is still itemizing. That is not what you want to do. Now, I'm not going to uh, take away points due to bad English. As long as I can understand you and you follow the format, it will be fine. Next one. If you do not answer the specific question or you use the wrong format, you will only get 50%. The highest score is 40. So if you use the wrong format or you don't use English or you don't actually answer the question, you will only get 20 points out of 40 points. There's a reason that uh, the numbers are like this. Do you remember the grading percentages? 40% midterm, 50% exam, 50% final project, 20% attendance. So if you screw up the midterm, you can still pass if you always come to class and you try your best on the final project. But if you don't come to class, and you screw up the midterm, you're probably not going to pass. Next one. You can write your answer somewhere else and then copy and paste the text of your answer into Moodle. I'm going to show you the actual answer space later. What I'm saying is you don't have to write the whole thing in Moodle. You can write it somewhere else and then copy it into Moodle and then submit. Now, in the past, I have had students think what this means is they can write it in Google Docs. And then on Moodle, they gave me the link to the Google Doc. Don't do that. Give me your actual answer. Uh, but you can write it somewhere else and then copy it into Moodle. Next one. You can submit as many answers as you want, and I will only give you the highest grade. So maybe after submitting your answer, you go and take a shower, and then as you're taking a shower, you think, wait, I forgot this point. And you go back and you submit another answer. I will only look at your best answer. I'll look at all of your answers. I will only give you the highest grade. So as long as you have time before the deadline, you can keep submitting answers if you think there are important things that you forgot to say. Next one, the exam is open book, open internet. You can use the notes, you can use the internet, you can go to the library, you can talk to me. 
The only thing you cannot do is talk to other people, including people online. The only other person you can talk to is me. Because I can control how much information to give you. Don't talk to your group members. Don't talk to your grandmother. Don't talk to strangers online. Don't talk to students who took the class before. Talk to me. Uh, right. I have had uh, students communicate before and I had to give them zero. Now, when I say you can talk to me, you can try to ask me anything. And the worst that will happen is I will say I can't answer. But you might be surprised at how much information I'm willing to give you. Next one. You must give specific evidence from the assigned film. The question will be about a short film. I'm going to show you the film later. When you answer the question, you have to give specific evidence from this film. You can't just talk about movies in general. You can't just say it feels like something, something, something. You have to give specific evidence. And by specific, I mean the timestamp, which part are you talking about? What time in the, in the film is it? Uh, and so when you talk about a specific moment or part of the short film, give me the timestamp. Tell me where in the film is it? If you don't have a timestamp, I'm going to pretend like you did not say anything. You have to give me the specific time and location of your evidence. Next one, it's open book. If you use information from other sources, you must also tell me where you got that information. And you have to tell me inside your answer. Please do not just put everything at the end. Put your source inside your answer. So let's say uh, you give an idea, blah, blah, blah. But this idea is from somewhere else. In this case, you should say blah, 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 parenthesis, waha, taken from this place, parenthesis. Right? Put your source right next to the information that uh, you got from it. Don't put it at the very end. Uh, so if you get information from somewhere else and you don't give me the source, I'm going to pretend again like I did not see it. You do have to give me the source. Finally, if you cheat, if you talk with somebody else, if you copy off of another source, you will get zero, not 20, zero. So don't cheat. Uh, and some of you might think, oh, so like I shouldn't copy my answer. But when I introduce the short film, I can copy so the online introduction. No, even the smallest things, even if you think it's not important, if you copy it from somewhere, put it in quotation marks and give me the source. Otherwise, use your own words. Don't copy. Uh, and then I guess that brings us to chat GPT, right? Um, let's put it this way. If you take what ChatGPT gives you and copy paste it into Moodle and then hit submit, you're not going to get a very high score. Not because you copied from ChatGPT, but because ChatGPT sucks. You do have to work for this. You don't have to work too much, but you do have to work for it. So those are the rules. Questions? OK, um, so some of you may not have done an essay question before in English. So this is an article in Chinese about plagiarism, Xi, why it's so important to avoid plagiarism. Here are some example answers to other essay questions. So the information in these essays will not help you. 
but the format Gersi, you can look at and uh, use the similar format. Uh, this is the link to the film. I will show you the film later. First, let's look at the answer space. Here's the question. Please watch the short film The Windshield Wiper linked on Moodle. How does it make you feel? Any semantic entry. Why? Your answer must mention at least four different filmic elements. And I give you a hint. The filmic elements include acting, cinematography, directing, editing, production design, uh, sound, symbolism, themes, visual effects, special effects, uh, and writing, so like the story. These are some of the things you can pay attention to while you watch the short film. You must mention at least four different elements, uh, either from this list or from your handout. Um, so it's not just four pieces of evidence. If you give four pieces of evidence and all four are about the story, that is one element. You need four elements. But you'll notice that the question itself is very open ended. There's no right or wrong answer. Uh, in the past, I have had students say this film felt boring and they gave evidence and I thought it was a good answer. It's honest and they explained why. So don't worry about which feeling or feelings your answer is. Worry about how do you explain those feelings. Uh, and then below you will see this really, really, really big white box. Don't worry about filling the box. The box is an infinite box. As a Udi Kwang. If you fill the box and you keep going, it will keep growing. This is just here to encourage you to put down all of your ideas. Use as much space as you need. So that's the question. The specific exam question. Uh, you want to ask me about this? OK, let's watch the short film. Uh, and if you're watching at home, you can click the link on Moodle. Teams does not do well with recording video. 